Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And I do hope you are as well as can be in these circumstances. <clears throat> Where shall we start today? I, do you, can I tell you something? I, I, I shall confide in you, if I may, that increasingly over the last few years, I've found myself almost having a sort of tinfoil hat approach to some elements of, of, of the news. And particularly in the last couple of weeks, I found myself thinking, what do they want us to talk about today? And feeling a very acute temptation to do the polar opposite. For example, I, I, I appreciate this is not a definitive view, and I, I mean no criticism of anybody who perhaps um, has reached different conclusions, but, uh, but I felt that all the talk about the 100,000 tests a day was a, was, was a little bit unnecessary. Um, uh, it, the huge increase in capacity and in testing that was achieved within a month looked like a very good achievement and would have still looked like a very good achievement if they'd said, oh, well, we've only hit 80-odd thousand, we didn't actually hit 100. Uh, and then, of course, in the subsequent days, they've never got close to hitting 100 again. I think yesterday was, was lower than ever, lower than anything since the day that we were supposed to be hitting 100,000 a day. And you see, even as I speak, that your eyelids begin to droop a little bit. Not in the way that they usually do, but in a way very specific to this particular subject matter. So we have a big toing and froing, and, and um, some people who perhaps have lost the ability to be objective, just start cheering, and then the next day, when the numbers are considerably lower than the numbers they were cheering yesterday, they, they just pretend it never happened. And those of us who perhaps are a little bit too addicted to reality just start pointing at the numbers and go, well, hang on a minute, you, this isn't an opinion, this isn't a political position, this is just counting. And you lost, but you're still cheering, is it? I, do you see what I mean? Why are we talking about that? Why are we talking about that? Well, it possibly speaks of competence on the part of the government, but anybody who still thinks this government is possessed of competence, it probably beyond help now. And then yesterday, when the United Kingdom, according to the official figures, and there will, of course, be room for some um, retuning of those official figures, we became the first country in Europe to pass the 30,000 mark. We overtook Italy as the country most affected, despite having all those early warnings. What, what, what were we encouraged to talk about yesterday? We were encouraged to talk about the sex life of the professor, one of the professors whose um, advice the government have been taking. And, and you know, I, I'm an old tabloid journalist. I get, I get the prurient appeal of a story like that. But 30,000 dead people? One bloke having a little bit of how's your father? quite how those scales work when it comes to prioritizing what we should be talking about is is currently beyond me and today the front pages and and the rest of the news is just baffling to be honest with you that there's almost a well not almost there's a celebratory air on the front pages of the what we used to call the cheaper prints so you know the sun it's almost as if we've just beaten germany in a world cup final the way that they've portrayed their front page story and, and the daily mail which is not having a bad crisis um by any stretch of the imagination uh, today hurrah lockdown freedom beckons now i don't think you know what that means i don't know what that means I don't think the people who wrote the articles for the Daily Mail know what that means. I just think that the tabloid tradition, and it's one that I've studied with a curious mixture of admiration and horror, the tabloid tradition of exciting an emotional response from you and me, regardless of the facts, seems to be kicking in in, in, in full effect today. You can even find contradictions. Now, whether the journalists have just been making it up as they go along, which, for the record, I don't believe, or whether the briefing coming from their sources is so confused and so contradictory that we end up reading that garden centres are going to open and then garden centres aren't going to open, that he's going to announce a timeline for school reopenings and he's not going to announce a timeline for school reopenings. I, I just don't know anymore whether it is just... Uh, incompetence on an almost unbelievable scale or and you know i spent the entire aftermath of brexit thinking this as well or there is some sort of alternative reality that we're just not permitted to see yet in which it somehow makes sense for us to be spending three or four days speculating uh, indulging in rumor claim and counterclaim regarding the loosening of a lockdown that is set to be announced or i suppose the 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 rabbit was released yesterday on a, on a day when over 640 people died and we only went into the lockdown if if memory serves on a day when um somewhere around the 350 
mark was reached. So I, I appreciate that there is a reasoning behind that statistic, but it's a statistic that if we were to view it in isolation would be baffling. So there's more people dying every day now than there were when we went into it, but we're coming out of it. Okay. Maybe that's what they don't want us to be talking about. You see what I mean about the Tim Four hat? Because quite how any positive purpose is served by engendering some sort of celebratory atmosphere regarding uh, a possible loosening of certain restrictions designed to keep us alive, designed to keep us safe, without proper clear explanations of, of what is being loosened and why, until apparently Sunday, when Boris Johnson will deliver a speech designed to allow him to avoid all scrutiny and questioning. That's why he's doing it. Um, uh, in, in an address to the nation. This, of course, is the fellow who postponed the COBRA meeting back in February because he, he, he wanted to sort of have a nice weekend. <laughs> this sense of urgency from him just doesn't wash, does it? And, and I don't know whether we should be loosening lockdown yet. That's forgivable. I'm a gob on a stick. They should know, or they should at least have a really clear line on, on what they're going to do and why. And one of the reasons we were given for them not being able to do the announcement in um, traditional and some would say constitutionally correct form, i.e. in the Parliament, the Parliament that Dominic Cummings was found to be in contempt of and Boris Johnson was found to have prorogued um, incorrectly, yet that Parliament there, the one they've got so much respect for, the reason why they're not doing it in Parliament is because they're still collating data and they won't actually have a clear bead on anything until Sunday morning, which is why they'll announce it on Sunday afternoon and then hopefully things will begin to start on Monday. Just think about it for a moment. Right, OK, so someone's briefing the newspapers about what's likely to happen, but you can't tell us what's likely to happen because you haven't collected all the data, which means you haven't actually got a plan yet. So the newspapers speculate furiously, and so would I if I'd been made slightly differently, I suppose, speculate furiously about what is and what is not likely to happen on Monday because there's an absolute vacuum of clarity and leadership at the very top of the country into which all sorts of dangerous nonsense can move. And if you've got a little Groundhog Day feeling right now, you're right. I've been saying this for the best part of two months now. When there is no clarity and leadership at the top, it creates a vacuum into which absolutely anything can move. And we're still at it. That's what's so incredible. We're still at it. I would now rather have a Prime Minister stand up in front of the country and say, look, folks, God knows. We've absolutely carked it so far. I go, we've got 400,000 gowns stuck in Heathrow. I am so sorry. We were so desperate to buy stuff. Turns out we did a deal with the Turkish equivalent of Derek Trotter. We've been flogged 400,000 dodgy gowns. I'm not even going to be able to get rid of them um, out the back of the Nelson Mandela Tower in the heart of sunny Peckham. But forgive me. I made a, We just muffed it up. We were too desperate. And then he says, I don't even know whether we should be coming out of the lockdown. It can't carry on indefinitely. Some scientists say this, some scientists say that. I'm going to have to take a view on it. And I just want you to understand what lies behind the view I've taken. Um, but I am really sorry about those gowns. Oh, and that statistician that I mentioned in PMQs yesterday, he's asked me to stop using his name in support of the idea that we shouldn't be making international comparisons. Yeah, that's, that's, that's me, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, standing up in Parliament, claiming support from a scientist, from a statistician, who had to take to social media to ask me not to cite him in support of what I was saying. That's where we are as a country. And we now look to this man to lead us out of the restrictions and the instructions that the lockdown entails. The man who led us into it in such a cack-handed fashion that some people still don't know what they are and are not supposed to be doing. The man who led us into something so weaker and looser than Spain and other countries, Italy even, that despite the fact that they were ahead of us and, and therefore sounding alarm bells and giving us warnings, we decided to do it after prevaricating and postponing and talking about taking it on the chin. We decided to do it in a half-hearted fashion that has still not properly cut through to parts of the country. He's the fellow that we're going to trust with the loosening at a time when more people are dying every day than they were when we went into it.
But hey-ho, tug that forelock, doff that cap, cheer old Boris Johnson and have a look at the baby pictures. What a magnificent time to be alive. Why am I in such a good mood? Well, I've just looked at the front page of the Sun newspaper and as far as I can tell, something amazing and fantastic is happening and we should all be celebrating. Um, let's get it right, shall we? Happy Monday. Go out to exercise all you like. Sit in park two metres from your pals. Pubs, cafes, plan to open gardens. Front of the mail. Hurrah! Lockdown freedom beckons. What do you think is happening? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. I am going to suggest to you that the government, that Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings, they haven't got a clue. What has happened today with these weird and often contradictory media briefings is that they're playing us just like they played Brexit. They're waiting to see what washes with the public regardless of whether it's true or not. This is £350 million written on the side of a bus, but with death rates. What's going to work? What are they going to buy? What are they going to go for? What's going to make us look good? What's going to make the approval ratings better regardless of reality? That, that's what we've done in Britain over the last four years. We have... We've, well, we've removed reality from the top of the things that matter. What matters is perception. What matters is polling. What matters is focus groups. What doesn't matter is facts. What doesn't matter is reality. What doesn't matter is evidence. This is just my theory. Feel free to pull it to pieces to your heart's content. But in order to do so, you're going to have to tell me what the plan is. Oh, we can't tell you what the plan is until Sunday. Then why the hell are newspapers being briefed about where we're going to be able to sit in pub gardens? Because there isn't a plan. And what will come out on Sunday will have been formed by this sort of audience research exercise that kicks off today with a bunch of supine and sycophantic newspapers effectively operating as opinion pollsters for a government that hasn't got a clue. And if you think I'm exaggerating, go and count those gowns at Heathrow. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. What do you think? is going on because my conclusion at 10:16 on this Thursday morning is that they still haven't got a clue what to do they're trying to cover it up by making all manner of suggestions and they will probably end up backing the ones that seem most likely to secure some sort of public support regardless of the medical the scientific or the epidemiological impact and why do I think that? Because that's exactly what they've been doing since the very start. It's 10.16, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I can't wait to hear from you after this. Before we get stuck into your answers to my question of, of what is going on now, the newspapers look as if they're celebrating victory over Germany on penalties in the final of a World Cup, but actually they're talking about the loosening of a lockdown on a day when more people are dying, when than were when we went into it. Can you make any sense at all of this? And can you cure me of my fear that Johnson and Cummings are still treating it like some sort of gaming exercise where reality is their enemy and the public are their pawns? 18 after 10 is the time. Before that, Rachel Venables has some disturbing news about death rates and ethnic breakdowns. Rachel, tell us more. James, the Office for National Statistics have found that some ethnic groups do have a significantly higher risk than those of white ethnicity of dying from COVID-19, from a coronavirus-related illness. They've looked at the number of deaths which occurred between the 2nd of March and the 10th of April, and once they take into account age, they have found some staggering statistics. Black women, for example, are 4.3 times more likely to die from coronavirus than white women. Black men, 4.2 times more likely likely to die again where compared uh, again when compared uh, to white males and that picture reflected across other groups as well people of Bangladeshi and Pakistani ethnicity more than three times as likely to die Indian ethnicity more than two times and mixed ethnicities as well they also had a statistically significant raised risk of death again compared to white people now obviously this is a topic of conversation that has raised real concern over the past few weeks we've been seeing reports of uh, black and ethnic minority people being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. But now in this data, we can really see clearly how it has been affecting different people from different backgrounds. I mean, this probably is too early to say with any certainty, but it, 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 are there any thoughts, any insights, any theories behind this that, or, or to explain what lies behind this? 
Yes, yeah, so there are a number of theories as to what might cause such a wide gap between mm. different ethnic groups. One of them is geographical. Uh, so our cities, particularly London, they have been hit much worse by this virus. And we also know that cities are much more likely to be much more multicultural, particularly compared to the rural areas which have suffered less. There are also socioeconomic factors. They're huge here. Last week, of course, James, you'll remember we spoke about how people in poorer areas were actually twice as likely to die from COVID-19 than people mm. in uh, much more wealthy areas. And the ONS have said that there is existing evidence to say that most ethnic minority groups do tend to be more disadvantaged. So questions here range about the sort of jobs that people from different backgrounds might be doing. Are they more likely to be able to stay at home and to work mm. over Zoom or are they forced to go out to work and to put themselves at risk. And the ONS are also investigating whether pre-existing health conditions have a place here. Are they skewing the data? So are certain groups more likely to have certain health conditions like asthma, diabetes, obesity? Again, things which we know really exacerbate the problem. What I will say is though, when uh, the ONS accounted for and adjusted for all of these socioeconomic factors, they did manage to close the gap slightly. So now they say when you look at all of that, the likelihood, for example, of a black person dying compared to a white person is still 90% higher. So it's smaller, mm -hmm. But there's still a massive gap there. This clearly isn't the whole story. Some really worrying data just showing us, I think, a little clearer about how this virus does seem to be discriminating. It does seem to affect certain people much more worse than others. Could it, could it have anything to do with, and I'm, I'm probably leading you away from areas in which either of us have any insights or expertise, but I've started to all finish. Could, could it have anything to do with the percentage representation within healthcare work? So I, I, I wonder whether ethnic minorities are overrepresented in percentage terms in the National Health Service than they are in the broader population. Well, certainly that reflects when they talked about the socioeconomic impacts, yeah. the sort of jobs that people from different groups are more or more, more or less likely to be doing. But as I mentioned, I, I believe jobs were, were counted into where they adjusted it down. So as I mentioned, black people still being 90% more likely to die uh, than yeah. a white person, all sorts of different factors are at play here and I think that's the sort of thing that the ONS certainly will be looking at and I know that there were real concerns particularly among medical uh, circles particularly when we started to see in the early days the number of people who were dying uh, who worked at the NHS and who worked in care homes doctors nurses porters many of them did seem to be from black and ethnic minority backgrounds and there were real concerns there raised obviously again we know our, our NHS is a hugely multicultural uh, organization but obviously that when you compare that to the number of people who, who have died overall from coronavirus, yeah. I don't think that quite accounts properly for the, the numbers and the differences here that we are seeing. But those numbers will need to be crunched at some point. Thank you, Rachel Venables. Grim news, grim tidings, which, as Rachel suggested, sort of reflect what was already suspected, but in even starker relief than perhaps many of us foresaw. 24 minutes after 10 is the time. What do you think is going on? We're now having... What day is it? Thursday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, much of yesterday. So at least four days, four and a half probably, give or take, of speculation, rumour, counter-rumour, claim, counter-claim about what the loosening of the lockdown will look like because Boris Johnson said he was going to announce it last Monday and then he said he couldn't so he'd announce it next Sunday. Almost like he shot his mouth off too soon in the hope of securing some soundbite-based positive coverage after um, returning to work. It... it it doesn't, I can't make sense of it yet, but I've got one theory for, well, the first theory is they haven't got, an, they just haven't got a clue. They haven't got a plan. They're throwing as much stuff at the wall to see what sticks, which is how you've ended up with newspapers almost contradicting each other about what's likely to be announced on Sunday. However, I mean, that's theory number one. It's a bit bleak. I've just started thinking up another one or, or, or building up another one, which actually may well stand up to scrutiny, but I don't want to second guess what you're going to say. So we'll hit the phones for a while first, uh, and I'll, I'll see whether any flesh appears on the bones of my new theory. Paul's in Wallacey. Paul, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Uh, totally in step with what you've been saying. Um, mm. I think what we're doing now is adapting, uh, sorry, adopting the Swedish model that has been uh, questioned by lots of public health uh, around the world, but it looks like we're going oh, that way. 
we're categorical. I mean, I don't want to have a fight so early in the programme, but we're, we're, we're categorically not going to be announcing on, on Sunday that we are um, emulating where, where Sweden was. For, for one very simple reason, the massive misunderstanding here about what Sweden has done is is actually behavioural science in that the Swedish population is a lot more amenable to voluntary steps and voluntary measures. So while they've been massively shocked by their, their death rate, the, the the British model is the opposite. So we, we, we may well be seeing the economy overtake human life as the guiding light for the government, but it's not actually fair to accuse Sweden of having done that, as I understand it, Paul. Yeah, you, you, you went on to my next point, really. I think I always <laughs> had thought from the beginning that economics will always top health. And, uh, you know, we've seen this with Trump's remarks in the last 24 hours. We're going yeah. the same way. They've got to get people back to work. It will be conditioning us now to accept numbers of deaths. You know, it's like saying, no, we're talking 50,000 this month, you know, which is so... And, and yet nobody would argue that we can stay in this level of lockdown which you know we we went into too late and was probably too light but regardless of those criticisms nobody could argue that we could stay that we could stay in it forever would they i mean we have to do something at some point to begin the return to to, to whatever the new normal may be i agree yeah i mean and this is what you ended on no one's got a clue how we do that i mean Look, well, yeah clarity and leadership again isn't it clarity and yeah. leadership Clarity, totally clarity, clarity. It's going to be useless because it's only going to work if someone's had regular tests. Otherwise, you don't know. If that well, that seems to that now that really is a lesson that we could learn from overseas. I, I think you're right, Paul. But again, you know, I'm back to where I was for most of the last four years, thinking that I'm pointing at a naked emperor, and and half the crowd are still insisting that he's wearing beautiful robes, and so many of the crowd are insisting that he's still wearing beautiful robes. I'm beginning to wonder whether there might be some sort of flesh-coloured body stocking there, but it's a, a lot a lot quieter a voice today than than it was during the Brexit shenanigans. Bob's in Portsmouth. Bob, what what, what is going on, Bob? Uh, well, they're basically, from from what I can see, uh, when I've been working, well, I work in I work in care homes sometimes, oh, okay. uh, and just just recently, I had to do a job in a care home. Uh, it was about two weeks ago, and this is just after we passed past peak, and the uh, care home staff, none of them had PPE on, um, and I walked past, and I had PPE on because just yeah. for my own personal self. But as I walked past their afternoon get together, there was a care home staff member literally talking within two two or three centimetres from this old lady's face. Mm. And and that and and I even had to phone up the manager and ask them why what's going on with this, because this is just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and they were told that they, they haven't been advised that they need PPE and then as I was on the phone to her she said she read out an email and said, Oh we've just been told we need to put PPE on now. Uh so that's why we got the problems so th in the care well, home. So care this home. is a retrospective illustration of the complete absence of clarity and leadership. I'm tired of saying this. It's making my jaw ache. Just because they had a disaster yesterday doesn't mean that they have to have a disaster tomorrow. But, yeah, but, now, but, but now, because they've got it all wrong from the beginning, that's why they're yeah. putting a positive spin on, and that's why they're trying to they get back to work, and it's all jolly, 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 uh, because they're just trying to make up for the fact that they've ruined it from the beginning. So all they can do is try to make out that they're that they're doing something positive and they're winning. So, yeah, actually, that, that that I mean, I guess so. So it is really bovine. It is really simplistic. They really are treating us like completely credulous children. But I suppose, oh, go on, Bob. They, I just, I'm just even from the point of view of the testing that they talk about how we started off with two thousand tests and we've ramped it up. Well, those 2,000 tests should have been, should have, the starting point should have been in February, the 2,000 tests, and it should have been... Yeah, but no, well, that's not fair. Boris Johnson had to go on holiday. Yeah, I know, but this is why, but he's got other people, it's not just him, but the whole, the whole infrastructure of how it works. <laughs> I think you may you, you 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 may have missed my sarcasm there, Bob, which I, I, no, I think I is actually to, it, it, it's actually to your credit because it is rather hard to believe that the prime minister went on holiday for a fortnight in the. Uh, in the month that would have proved most crucial to our preparations and response. But hey, Bob, i got to crack on. I'm late, I'm late for the news. I'm late for the news. I'm, I'm not in the studio, so I'd still sit here putting my hand across my throat, which is the time-honoured way of saying, let's, let's move on, let's, con let's, let's conclude this call. But of course, nobody can see me. Just quietly going mad in a garden shed. And Gary Lineker has just made a, a characteristically um, clever point. How would you feel if you'd lost someone? How would you feel if, if among the 30,000 that have died, 
that are, that's according to the official figures, of course, the modelling that the Financial Times has undertaken pushes it, I think now, very close to or slightly in excess of 50,000. How would you feel walking past the newsstand this morning, saying, Happy Monday! on the front page of the Sun. Hurrah! Lockdown freedom beckons on the front page of the Mail. How would you feel if you couldn't go to your loved one's funeral? to see it reported like this. It, I mean, it is breathtaking, and it's why I'm asking you a much more simplistic question than I usually do. What do you think is going on? What do you think is going on? My theory at the moment is that they haven't got a clue, so they're just looking for the new 350 million on the side of a bus, which will encourage people to support them regardless of reality. What's going to work? What's going to work? Hurrah, lockdown freedom back. It's sick, isn't it, actually? So it's up, some days it feels as if we've been served up such an unleavened diet of disingenuous and d disingenuousness, just put my teeth in, and deceit for so long that, that you actually begin to lose sight of, of, of what you consider to be true. Donald Trump now is, in, in American press conferences, literally abusing journalists on, on national time. I mean, literally by name, pointing at them. Rather than asking questions, answering questions, he is ad hominem-ing them. It's, it's as if the thickest, nastiest, meanest Twitter troll in the world is in the White House and, and now no longer confining his vitriol and bile to Twitter, but actually spitting it from behind a lectern in the White House. Unbelievable. Uh, Alex is in Watford. Alex, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. I cannot Hello, challenge you on your clear blue water thinking okay. um uh, uh, the there's two more points i'd like to make yes i do challenge the, the government they've got your life and my life in their hands yes and the, the third point is yeah but uh, yeah but mate you could be back in the pub garden next week i mean come on swings and roundabouts oh you're you're you're, you're on the money <laughs> uh, right. the, uh, churchill a quote history he, after 17 days of coming to power, he had the foresight and insight to get the war cabinet under control. They wanted to do a deal with uh, Hitler through Mussolini. He said, no, I will not turn my back on the British people. And he brought over 350,000 troops back from Dunkirk. He said what he, he, he said he was going to do and save the war. You, I just, just to... Just to pause you there. Are you sure he didn't go on holiday for a fortnight during that period? No, he didn't. He was oh, right. foresight and he had the, and he was concerned about what the British people would think um, and then he didn't want to let the British people down. You asked me the question, we haven't got the right man uh, doing the job at the moment. I'm sorry, <laughs> Boris, you haven't got it. It does feel that way, doesn't it? But what, what, what about a plan? I mean, it, 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 I don't care who the man is. If the plan is good, it, I don't mind which man, but I, I guess it's hard to separate the two. It, where, where's Boris's integrity? Where is Boris uh, uh, saying what he does? Goes on holiday, uh, you know. There's people. It is odd, and and but again, as I, you know, I tire of saying just because yesterday was disastrous doesn't mean that tomorrow has to be. But of course, it becomes an issue of trust. Alex, thank you. It becomes an issue of trust. So. <laughs> the people that we need to trust to get us out of it are the same people who've made such a mess of getting us into it. And that's a real problem in, in, in a normal society. The only way it can possibly be solved in a positive way is for them to win our trust. That would involve clarity and leadership. Hashtag better late than never. But from their point of view, it's, it's never been about that. From, from the minute that vote leave organization was put together it was always about how can we get the public to do what we want regardless of whether it's good for them or not in fact how can we get the public to do something that's bad for them well let's spook them with a little bit of racism about turkey and then go begging to turkey three and a half years later to buy ppe equipment because we're so badly prepared for it and we're so desperate for some good pr we end up buying four hundred thousand gowns that we can't use but you tell me again why we should trust the people who did that to get us out of this as safely and as alive as possible. Phone lines are open. I'll take anything today. 0345 606 0973. Jeremy's in Derby. Jeremy, w w what is going on? Oh, I'm so sad and angry today, but, uh, James. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, it's only. amazing. I mean, it's sad, sad that so many people have died, and yet you kind of hope that they would learn from it and start doing something right. And you think, uh, about a week ago, I thought maybe Hancock was starting to get the hang of it, and then Boris is back, and 
talking about ending the lockdown completely the wrong time, completely the wrong timing. He doesn't understand. He's got no... Or, or, or even if so, even if next week is the right time, having four Not days right of speculation time. and... Se well, I don't think it is either, but neither of us are... are, are you well, know, I, can, well, I can give some figures if you want. I mean, the, the COVID tracking app is saying that we currently got about 250,000 people still infected. Now, even if, right. we, even if the test levels are what we've got, then we can't test that many people. And it's only... A, we've still only got a, a 0.7 R number, so that means... In a week's time... 0.7 to 0.9, isn't it? Is it uh, well, yeah, well, let's is, say it's 0.7, which is good. You know, take the best case in a scenario. In time, we still have 175,000 people. That's one in 300 people still infected. Are you going to send your kids to school when there's one in 300 people infected? I don't think it'll be an option, but, of course, they're speculating about that now. For what, what, I mean, so, the so terrifying there's, there's thing. No plan, they should be able to say, right, when we get to this level of people and this number of things, then we can do things. But they say, oh, we might do something on Monday if we hope the numbers are right. They, Yes, but that's why I want, that, that's why, and now we move away from counting into speculation, which is all we can do, really, and because that is the vacuum that is left when clarity and leadership leave the building. <laughs> why? Why have they done it in a way that is going to create three, four days of speculation and counter-speculation? I mean, did they not realise what was going to happen, or is this the plan? I mean, again, we're back to this the question of... To try and not just to hide the real facts from people, get them all jolly. We've got VE Day tomorrow to have all fun and games and all these newspaper headlines, like you're saying. It's mm. just so sad. We, they, you know, it, it, people will be less fearful if they knew the facts and understood where we're going and had a plan of where we're going to go. There's less uncertainty. They say, we, this is really what's going to happen. These are the numbers. This is where we are. This is what's yeah. likely to happen in the next six weeks. And, you know, and it's not going weeks. to be pretty. I mean, you can say it's yeah. not going I mean, there, there, are, you, you, there is no perfect solution to this. It, whatever we do will hurt, yeah. but our job is to minimise the hurt. It's been your job from the beginning to, to get the number of avoidable deaths down to as close to zero as possible. And as things stand, it looks like we've got more than anybody else in the world them. except yeah, America. We'll, we'll, have the, we'll, have the, we'll have the R number creeping up. It doesn't take, if it's point seven, it doesn't take much to go over one. And then we're off to, off to another exponential growth again. It's just, it's just, you know, and they've messed the app up, it would seem. It's just, you know... I, so there's reports today that they're reverse ferreting on the app and that, that, that oh. somebody's been given a contract to look at whether or not the Google Apple one actually might be a better course of action after all. Well, I, I think that's in the Financial Times. Again, whenever I say things like that from memory, I'm happy to correct them if I turn out to have misremembered. I'll tell you something I haven't misremembered. This, this call to end the lockdown, these ghouls essentially arguing, and, and it's weird how many of them are also on that list of right-wing politicians and commentators who are normally trumpeting about their Christianity. I don't know if anyone else has picked up on this or whether it's just one of my obsessions, but the, the, the so-called Christians um, on the right of the Conservative Party seem to be shouting the loudest about why we should um, accept a few more deaths than necessary in order to uh, I improve the economic scenario. That seems to have been led by to me by the Daily Telegraph and it occurred to me a couple of days ago that the Daily Telegraph is of course owned by billionaires who actually live on a private island. So so the bankrolling of the anti-lockdown movement for people living in one of the most densely populated cities in the world is coming from men who live on a private island. That, that, I mean is it just me or does that strike you as, how could we put it, ironic? Maybe. Uh, it, so, it, so, yeah. I'm still there, sorry. No, you are, but but you got you got turned down. So we missed your um we missed your pearl of wisdom in in response to that. I don't I don't have any. I'm nowhere near my buttons. Not that I have any control over them normally, but as I mentioned a moment ago, my my, my comical gestures communicate. I mean, to, go on. I, I, I don't know what I mean. It's billionaires or what you know. We, obviously, we've got to get people. You know, looking surviving as much as we can, and you know they need to be supported financially and so on as much as we can. But they've also got to understand where we really are. And, and we really have messed up. We've got to pause a bit and get our numbers right down until... Well, we is that, is that, is that the we're, problem? We're in a safe, safe position again. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it is the, it is the reluctance. Say, look, we've messed up, you know. They or, can't do that, though. They, because I think there's too much... Well, I, I, this is where you know that I'm like a stuck record at this point. They, they, they can't do that because of Brexit. You well, can't stand up and say, we, we are complete flipping clowns. We've muffed absolutely everything up. Anyone who trusted us is an idiot. Oh, and by the way, at the end of this year, we're pulling out of the largest single market on the planet just as our economy takes a hit like no hit yeah, that has ever been they taken couldn't, before. Couldn't even, couldn't even admit. They just, you know, we, like you say, we got to 80,000. That was pretty good, guys. Let's move on from yeah. there. They yeah, can't even take say, the win. Oh, it's just... 
Just be Take honest. the score draw. Take the score draw. Yeah. 80,000 tests. We said there'd be 100,000, but 80,000 is a hell of a lot better than 5,000. So take the score draw. Can't do that. It's all about spin, all about bluster, all about and the Tufton Downey Street target, cabal. Hide the values, hide what we're saying, you know, and just... And, <sighs> How hard, and, and I don't know if any four-lock tuggers will ring me today, or pe perhaps reformed four-lock tuggers, four-lock tuggers who've seen the light, this notion in Britain that if you talk in a posh accent and bounce around in a funny fashion, then you're somehow qualified for leadership and must be cleverer than ordinary folk doing difficult jobs in places like hospitals and fire stations and supermarkets. I wonder if any four-lock tuggers could, could tell us how bad it would have to get before the before the gloss got knocked off Boris Johnson. Ten for, and, and again, we're back to Brexit because I think it's too much invested. People are too entrenched in their blind tribal support for the individual rather than the evidence. But anyway, Bob, thank you. Uh, I've got to crack on, Bob. I, I, I've got to find some new way. It's weird. We've been doing this for two months and I, I seem to have lost the ability to, to communicate um, when, when I need to bring a call to an end in order to head to a break or indeed to head towards another call. 0345 6060 is the number you can call. What do you think is going on? There seems to be a broad consensus that there is no plan, in which case, briefing various newspapers with various different possibilities of a potential plan seems to me to be, I mean, catastrophically dangerous, I, I, disgustingly dangerous. And again, I'd ask you, I really would. I tell you what worries me the most on a personal rather than a political level, on an empathetic level, as a member of a society, is, is the people who've lost loved ones must be feeling so ignored. You're just a statistic, a meaningless number. You couldn't even have a proper funeral and now you're looking at front pages telling you to start celebrating because you might be able to sit in a park on Tuesday. It's just gross. It's just gross. That's not politics either, that's humanity. Well, I'm just asking you what you think is going on, because quite frankly, we're in one of those zones now where your guess is as good as anyone's, and it is pretty much clear, isn't it, that the government haven't got a clue what to do. They don't know what they're doing, they don't know what they did, and they don't know what they should do. They just can't tell you that because their entire project is based upon, trust me, trust me, I'll get Brexit done. That's it. That's all they've got. And how? Well, by lying to us, by proroguing Parliament, by having a special advisor who was found to be in contempt of it, by refusing to answer questions about data harvesting, by uh, running an organisation found to have broken electoral law by the Electoral Commission. And now they're sitting in Downing Street telling you to trust them. And the problem is, half the country did. And they must feel so stupid as the body count grows and grows and grows. And even if they get something right in the future, please God they will, there's already been... Too many deaths to countenance. And yet, you tug your forelock hard enough, presumably you can still keep the notion that Boris Johnson is anything other than a walking disaster front and foremost in your mind. It breaks my heart, this. It really, really breaks my heart. And that question there, how would you feel if you'd had the horror of losing a loved one, the knife-twisting uh, injury of not being able to have a proper funeral and now to see your newspapers and your government trying to turn the loosening of a lockdown that they've made an absolute pig's ear of from the start into some sort of cause for national celebration. Quite astonishing. I don't think I've ever been more shocked by the tone of newspaper front pages. I really don't and goodness knows I've been shocked plenty of times over the years. Bob's in Leighton Buzzard. Bob, what would you like to say? Uh, morning, James. Hello, Bob. Um, I'm confused. You're not the only one. Um, the obvious question seems to me, uh, repeatedly, and it happened again yesterday, uh, the government had one clear plan regarding lockdown, yes. and that was there would be no adjustment to lockdown until their five tests had been met. Yes. Now, as far as I know, no medical or science advisor said that any of the five tests had been met. So why are we talking about easing the lockdown? It said any adjustment to the lockdown must meet these five tests. Hmm. And no I mean, it's a very good question. I can't off the top. I'm just looking up what the five tests were, so well, I'll get them absolutely well, right. The but... is there was a programme this morning, they had a government minister on, and I yeah. thought that is the obvious question to ask. And, and no one asked. did. Well, to ensuring that the NHS can cope, all right? So we'll give them that, will we, I think? No. Oh, because of no, care I'll homes. No, I'll tell you why. Go um, on. You know, uh, Italy was criticised for uh, being overwhelmed, their NHS. But what it meant was they used their capacity to fall, yeah? Yeah. 
We haven't done that. Our capacity is at less than 35% for critical beds, and yet 200,000 people have got coronavirus. Why aren't yeah. they in hospital? Why aren't they, aren't they in the Nightingale Hospital? Why have they been left at home to die? I d- I, well, we touched on this yesterday, and it's very hard to come up with a, a how could we put it, an encouraging answer. I mean, the whole, the, the, the whole ethos of the government has been this mantra about um, uh, having capacity in the NHS. I don't see that as a positive thing at all. Well, no, I understand why, but it, but it does, it does. I, I, I think, unless, unless you, you're, you're ahead of me on this one, that, that you could certainly make the case that the NHS has coped and can cope with with COVID nineteen. And and we spoke yesterday. I don't know if you were listening to a, a lovely bloke who is normally a cancer specialist, a consultant. He's been redeployed to COVID nineteen to ITU, and he's now going back to his normal job on the cancer side of it. So, so I think you could make a case for that. The problem is, of course. That six was it six hundred and forty nine deaths yesterday, which everybody who's been following even cursorily the science would think, well, that means that those people were infected three or four weeks ago, knowing what we know about how the um, uh, the virus incubates and how it presents and how it escalates. So they would have been infected three or four weeks ago. So six hundred and forty nine people infected three or four weeks ago when we were in lockdown. Let's loosen it and expect the death rate to, to come down. It's also, I think, test two. I, I don't know that the death rate could be described as a sustained and consistent fall, do you? No. Um, and then test three? Now, you make a brilliant are, point. No, yeah. hang on. Test three, rate of infection decreasing to manageable levels. I, I don't know that that was ever really workable because of testing. But test four, ensuring supply of tests and PPE can meet future demand. Now, he's already walked back from saying we'd have 250,000 tests a day to saying we'll hit 200,000 soon. We haven't hit the 100,000 tests a day that they swore blind they'd have achieved by the end of this month. They figured, fiddled the figures to get one day of positive press coverage, so I don't think they could claim that they'd ensured supply of tests and PPE to meet future demand anyway. There's a worrying aspect to this uh, Go on. mass testing, and, and that's this. I, I saw a uh, spokesman last night, and he said that one of the consequences of ramping up the testing has been that where frontline health workers would get a test and get the result the next day, they now take the test and they don't get the result for five days. Yes. Because the laboratories are overwhelmed by tests yes. coming in. Uh, and the other point is they, they sent out 40, approximately 40,000 tests on the last day of the month by post. Now, a bad test is worse than no test, because what will happen is a percentage of those tests will be faulty. People will get a negative result, think they haven't got a the false, virus. A false negative. I don't know about that. I, don't, I, I, I know it's a theory, I, but I, I, I don't want to add to fears without 100% certainty that they're well-founded. And, and I'll tell you, I have heard from... Um, I heard from one person who who had a test, did a postal test. His wife is a GP, so she administered the test, which m- means, you know, her being a GP, it's more likely to have been done correctly than if I'd done it, for example, or or or, or, or anyone else. And he's got his results that the test was void, and he would have been counted as someone that was sent the test. He tells me, and and it's actually void. So that might just be a one-off. But it's a cause for concern. I, 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 well, I mean, to answer the question of what you think is going on, the, 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 nobody knows. So the only conclusion you're left with is that ignorance extends right to the top of the government. And they're just going to try and find a bus, a £350 million a week for the NHS bus, that they can use to persuade enough of the public that they're not making it up as they go along or making promises that will be broken the very next day. I mean, that's the frankly astonishing thing. You know, taking rounds of applause, looking like he'd won an Oscar when they apparently hit the 100,000 tests for one day, of course, there's a a very strong argument that they actually didn't, but they haven't come close to it since. And yet he took it, he did a lap of honour. And Matt Hancock, for me, is one of the best of the bunch. 10.55 is the time. Bob, take care. John's in East Sussex. John, what is going on? Um, I'm afraid to say, and I think it's regrettable, that uh, the leaders of our country are completely and utterly incompetent. Um, Not... Worse than that, I guess incompetence and ignorance you could excuse. Mm. Uh, you can argue that uh, when 
people are running your country, maybe you can't excuse them. But uh, they are actually being willfully ignorant. They've initiated the call of our elders. 50,000 people dead so far. Yeah. It's shocking. Um, the fact that I am still able to be shocked by our government actually shocks me. And yet yeah. every morning I wake up and they seem I'm to I'm exactly the same. Into I mean, the abyss. Yes, well, some days I, I'm not. Some days it's like swimming in treacle. And then the strangest things can, can sort of reanimate you, can't you? And, and for me, I think because newspapers have been in my blood since birth, it's these front pages that look like it, they're, they're, they're greeting some sort of lottery win or, or a football triumph. And as you say, the, the it, informed That's estimate is 50,000 dead people, 50,000 grieving families being told by their newspaper front pages and their government to start celebrating the fact that they might be able to go to the park a bit more often than they could last week. And, and of course, we have a weekend coming of the well, blitz this is, spirit. God, oh, I don't, I mean, just, it, I don't know. <laughs> it's, um, it's incompetence on a grand level, and, you know... <laughs> I, I, and what I, what what I, better? I mean, I, I don't want to be. It, it, I, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's breathtaking. It's but look at Trump. Trump's still got uh, among men in America. Trump's still enjoying a small lead over his Democratic rival, and and you know he is now re reduced to telling people to inject themselves with bleach. These these polling numbers. It is the thing we've been dancing around for four years for reasons that the rest of us can't quite understand and possibly never will. You've invested so much personally and, and politically in men who are utterly, utterly unfit that to admit that to yourself is impossible. So those of us expecting them to be able to admit it to us are, you know, probably inhabiting cloud, cloud cuckoo land. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I'd pay money now for an alternative analysis, somebody who could say, oh, no, it's great that we've got contradictory messaging about what the loosening of the lockdown might look like four days from now, and we're going to spend the intervening period three days from now. We're going to spend the intervening period arguing, speculating, and uh, contradicting each other. Let me explain to you, James, why this is actually brilliant leadership, and you're quite wrong to talk about an absence of clarity. That, that call, for me, would be golden. But I'm not going to hold my breath. 0345 is the number that you need. Um, I, I'll come to you first after the news, I think, Ellie, rather than squeeze you into the minute that remains in this hour of the programme. It is Thursday. You may have to check. Some weeks you completely lose track of it, don't you? And other weeks you're, you're acutely conscious of the slow ticking of time. But it is Thursday. I've double-checked, which means that at 12 noon today we will be doing Mystery Hour. And if you've been busy or, or you haven't been tuning in, um, lately, then something rather magical has happened to Mystery Hour over the last few weeks in that it's been completely overtaken. It's been occupied by, well, people with roughly an average age of 10 or 11. And my goodness me, it's, it's all the better for it. And the listen is even better than usual because, well, I, I don't know why, actually. It just, it just reaches parts that even Mystery Hour can't normally reach. So make sure you stick around for that. We'll be kicking off at 12. And in the next hour, I'm going to just open up something that I need your help getting right. It, it was already on my list. It was already in the plan for today. But that little observation there about how the families of people who've already died are going to feel about the tone that the government is asking newspapers to adopt, this celebratory tone, seems to me to be so at odds with humanity that I, I want to try to start putting some names and some stories to the numbers. So w we're going to hear from a, at least one person a, a, in the public eye who's lost a relative, and we're going to hear a little bit more about their relative, and I'm hoping that we might be able to do something similar moving forward, that we might be able to take a, just a couple of minutes to find out a little bit more about who you lost. Because hearing them described every day as, well, it, it's 30,000 officially and it might be 50,000. If that's dad or grandma or your husband or your son, your wife, your daughter, your auntie, your cousin, your friend, your neighbour, your colleague, I, I, I think that must be adding insult to deep, deep injury and we're going to try in our tiny little way to, to redress the balance a bit. But I will obviously need not just your help in, in getting stories to air, but, but also your support in getting the tone right. Because we wouldn't want Matthew Hancock to tell us off, would we? Mm -hmm.